Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post. This week, the propaganda battle over Syria reaches a new low. Who's winning the online war now? The power of language. There are some new rules going into effect over the touchy question of terminology. The White House's hardcore approach to whistleblowers. Now it's Fox News' turn to hire a lawyer. And YouTube turns eight years old and celebrates by posting more videos on YouTube. Wait, hold up, don't go too fast. Once you dive in, you can never turn back. That's our web video of the week. For more than two years now, online video sharing websites have been the prism through which the story of the conflict in Syria has been told. Opposition forces have been able to effectively communicate their version of events to news organizations that have, for the most part, been locked out of the country. But in recent months, the rebels' new media strategy has been backfiring. We're seeing more and more graphic videos of torture, executions, and now cannibalism. The cumulative effect of those videos has damaged the rebels' cause and led outsiders to conclude that both sides in this war have committed gross human rights violations. And the online battle has intensified as well. At the outset of the fighting, the opposition was winning the online war. Now it's losing ground to cyber warriors on the government side. And a pro-Assad group called the Syrian Electronic Army has started hacking mainstream news outlets like the Associated Press, the BBC, and the Financial Times to draw attention to what it calls biased and inaccurate reporting. Our starting point this week is the Syrian capital, Damascus. They do have a battle that's taking place online, um, concurrent to the one taking place offline. The actual people who are involved in the conflict, who are fighting, they are also the media producers. And there is now no pretense towards a democratic or humanitarian ideal. And that ref that's reflective in the type of videos that are being uploaded. Indicates the desperation of some of the obviously more extreme elements. The militia leader goes by the name of Abu Sakar, and his was a gruesome crime of war. Standing above a dead government soldier, knife in hand, he takes what appears to be the soldier's heart and a lung and shows them to the camera. We swear to God, he said, that we will eat your hearts and livers, you soldiers of Bashar the dog. Then he tears into the lung with his teeth. When you watch it, you almost feel as if it's a, you know, a documentary about hunting and a, a guy who just uh, killed a deer and he's narrating you know, how he killed it and you know, how he's gonna skin it and, and cook it up for dinner. I mean, that's, that's the kind of the feeling that you get from which is very disturbing. To begin with, uh, they claimed that their revolution was one of uh, a, a revolution for democracy, for human rights, and therefore they, there was a certain discipline in the type of videos that were being uploaded. But that narrative has fallen apart simply because the international community has not intervened, and therefore they feel they have no moral obligation to live up to those uh, uh, humanitarian ideals. And now they are uploading all sorts of videos that show the ugly side of the conflict. But what is new about this is the fact that ordinary people, like ordinary soldiers on the ground, are able to take these images and send them. And we are seeing it without editing, without journalists coming in and thinking about uh, issues of social responsibility or issues of morality or ethical issues related to journalistic practices. We don't have that. Anyone can use them and anyone can project their own feelings and identities. But that doesn't mean that anyone represents everyone. The video appeared online on May 12th, but two Time magazine journalists say they first saw it in April, obtained a copy, but did not report on it because they were trying to ensure the footage was real. Time took that approach, the magazine said, since a digitally altered film would provide powerful propaganda for the Assad regime. And when the video surfaced publicly, it was on a pro-government website. It's a grisly symbol of the horrors that Syria is going through right now. The For news organizations trying to cover Syria and largely reliant on citizen journalism to do that, the Abu Sakar film was another difficult editorial decision in a war that is full of them. These savage videos and using them in coverage is, is a really tough call for journalists because on the one hand, it, it's real. On the other hand, it really jades the coverage. The challenge for media is to figure out when to use such graphic footage and when not to. And again, because we can't measure what real public opinion is, it's very, very difficult for even the most 
objective and conscientious journalist and, and makes it very hard for people to develop an objective view of the conflict. In a sense, we have been very happy with the, with the ways in which citizen journalism has helped expose the problems in different parts of the Arab world. And this has been a, a very positive thing. But in a situation like this, where you have extreme violence enacted by one person against another, it kind of opens question about media's responsibility. What do we do as media people? What is the responsibility of, of journalism here? Abu Sakar himself confirmed the film was genuine in another video that appeared on the Time magazine website May 17th. He was anything but apologetic. One person's PR disaster can be another's publicity coup. A militia leader like Abu Sakkar, one way in which he can become famous overnight is to do something spectacular, uh, uh, such as you know, an act of cannibalism, uh, which doesn't do the revolution any favors, but it could possibly do him a huge favor by making him famous and potentially attract funding, because there are funders of the revolution, of the armed opposition inside the country, who want to promote very vicious, fearsome uh, warlords to fight the regime forces. They want people who will kill as many regime soldiers uh, as possible mercilessly. Rebel fighters have complained of a lack of international backing in this war, but videos like Abu Sakr's will make it harder for them to maintain what support they have had. The rebels have also suffered losses in the online war to the regime which has been making steady progress in the social media battle. And recently, the pro-Assad Syrian Electronic Army has taken the fight to Western news organizations, hacking their way into some major news sites and Twitter accounts. When the Syrian Electronic Army emerged in early 2011, it wasn't clear whether they were a governmental group um, or just a, a group of um, activists supporting the regime. Um, but in a speech in June 2011, President Assad actually recognized them as a virtual army in cyberspace. It's not entirely clear where the activities of the Syrian Electronic Army end and the activities of the government begin. In the first six months or so uh, of the revolution, the regime's media strategy was ham-fisted and it wasn't particularly uh, sophisticated. Since then, they got their act together. So the opposition has uh, YouTube channels. Now regime supporters have YouTube channels. The internet war between regime and opposition cyber activists is really an external uh, war. Uh, people inside the country, uh, majority of people inside, don't have internet access. And if they, even if they do, it tends to be slow and monitored by the regime. Uh, it's about control of the media narrative externally. And so we've seen them go after um, news feeds such as the BBC and uh, the Associated Press, um, as well as more alternative feeds such as the, the satire site, The Onion. Um, and I think that the purpose behind this is for the Syrian Electronic Army to reach mainstream viewers with their narrative, which essentially supports the Assad regime's narrative that this is not a rebel uprising, but in fact a terrorist uprising. That's Syria, two years and two months into the uprising an estimated 70,000 lives lost, atrocities committed, some for the sake of the camera. Territory, once left to journalists, has been invaded by electronic armies on both sides. And the moral high ground is occupied by night. Our Global Village Voice is now on Syria and the online information war. War is brutal, and the recent YouTube video shows us Really, it breaks away from the sanitized view of war that we've been seeing up till now. And this is a scare tactic. By brutalizing and by showing such acts of gore and violence, they are intending to scare elements that are still supporting the Assad regime into submission. The Syrian Electronic Army believe that they are working for a free Syria and they believe that one day they will be successful. It's time for media outlets to be careful because these hackers can really embarrass you. At the same time, you cannot change ground realities or you cannot change a war in a country by hacking someone's Twitter account or Facebook account. It's time now for Listening Post News Bites. The chilling effect of the White House's war on whistleblowers is spreading. Last week, it was the Associated Press revealing it had been under investigation. This past week, it was Fox News. At the center of the story is Fox reporter James Rosen. In 2009, he wrote an article stating that North Korea would likely conduct further missile tests. Rosen cited unnamed U.S. intelligence sources, prompting Justice Department officials to look into the case. 
Charges were eventually brought against former State Department arms expert Stephen Jinwoo Kim for leaking classified information. However, court documents published by the Washington Post now show that Rosen himself was also under the microscope. His phone records were seized by the FBI, his emails were searched, and his movements in and out of the State Department building were monitored. Investigators also called him a possible co-conspirator in the leak, in other words, a potential criminal. Fox News' executive vice president, Michael Clemente, said he was outraged that Rosen was named a criminal co-conspirator for simply doing his job as a reporter. It is downright chilling, he said. In defense of the administration, White House there Press Secretary Jay Carney said that while President Obama is a strong defender of the First Amendment, he is also insistent that we protect our secrets, that we protect classified information. In Iran, there appears to be an effort to crack down on opposition voices in the media ahead of next month's election. Iranian web users have reported a slower internet while critical websites have been blocked and journalists have been arrested or sent back to prison. Commentators say the authorities are trying to stifle coverage after Iran's Guardian Council barred two leading candidates from the election, Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani and an ally of President Ahmadinejad, Esfandiyar Rahim Mashayi. This past week, at least four websites that had shown support for Mashayi were allegedly blocked. That followed a larger clampdown on critical voices in the media earlier this month. The editor-in-chief and the managing editor of a news website called Baztab were both reportedly arrested. Sharif Mansour of the New York-based Committee to Protect Journalists said, What kind of an election is it when journalists are tossed into prison and voters are denied access? To the news. There's an unusual media story unfolding in Toronto involving the city's mayor, allegations of drug use, and crowdsourced journalism. The politician is Rob Ford. Two reporters from the Toronto Star, Canada's largest English language paper, say they were investigating rumors of Ford and drug use when they say their inquiries led them to a man who said he'd supplied the mayor with crack cocaine and filmed him smoking it. The star reporters say they were shown a video that was also shown to the editor of the gossipy U.S. website Gawker. It's kind of mumbling incoherently. They all describe footage showing Ford with a glass pipe in one hand, a cigarette lighter in the other. Eventually, he lights the pipe and smokes it. But the man who shot the video wants $200,000 to hand it over, money that neither news outlet is prepared to pay. But Gawker may have found the solution, crowdfunding. Ford haters or anyone with a few spare dollars can now help make that video go viral through the Rob Ford Crackstarter fundraising campaign. With more than half the $200,000 already pledged, the video may well be online soon. The mayor, who's a conservative, calls the allegations ridiculous and says they are just the latest example of the star, a liberal paper, campaigning against him. We're going to take a look now at journalism and language, a few terms in particular. Journalists are supposed to choose their words carefully. And most news organizations have books that spell out the do's and don'ts of terminology, what kind of language to use when dealing with contentious topics, and what terms to avoid. Over the past month, the world's largest news agency, the Associated Press, has made two significant changes to its style book. Out goes the term illegal to describe certain kinds of immigrants. And the AP also has new rules on how to use the word Islamist. The Listening Post's Marcella Pizarro now on changing terminology in the news business and the importance of words. Words can inform, but they can also inflame. The news business is a minefield of controversial terminology. And last month, the news agency The Associated Press called time on one phrase, illegal immigrants. The reason given? The word illegal should not be used to describe a person. Illegal, according to the AP, should only describe an action, such as living in a country illegally. It was a victory for Latino advocacy groups who have long said the term is offensive. The debate about immigration in the United States has changed dramatically. People have an appreciation for the value that, that uh, immigrants, particularly Latino immigrants, uh, have to the American economy to American society, and so that explains why we are now more willing or more likely to have some kind of immigration reform legislation go through the Congress. And the AP style book is often just a reflection of changing public attitudes about an issue or a, a cultural change in America, and so it's, it's, it's a catching up, if you will. After a legal immigrant was dropped from the AP style book, you saw the New York Times 
and now the Los Angeles Times following suit. And so this really shows the influence of that kind of change uh, on the rest of print media. AP Style Guide is among the most influential in the news business. The agency provides wire services to thousands of news organizations. That's 1,400 print outlets in the US alone and 5,000 broadcasters around the world. So when the AP makes a change, it matters not just for the agency, but for all who subscribe to its services and adopt its language. Two days after changing the way it describes undocumented immigrants, the AP announced it would be revising its use of the term Islamist. The style book entry now reads, an advocate or supporter of a political movement that favors reordering government and society in accordance with laws prescribed by Islam do not use as a synonym for Islamic fighters, militants, extremists, or radicals who may or may not be Islamists. What we're seeing post 9-11 and across our time in a globalizing planet is more sensitivity to what words mean and to the implications the terminology has. And the term Islamist is, I mean, I don't know what that means. Is that somebody who believes in Islam? Protests by Islamists. Is that somebody who believes fervently in Islam? Black flags, the Islamists. Is that an extremist? Is that a terrorist? And that's the problem with that term. This word doesn't make sense. It's, it's almost a racist word. Uh, and if it were used in conjunction with another religion, I'm, I'm not sure what the word would be, but it, it would be subject of ridicule and huge debate because it does, does it mean that someone who is a dedicated Christian or a dedicated Jew is by definition radicalized? No. Just after 9-11, news organizations were already changing their use of language. Reuters issued an internal memo about the use of the word terrorist. The news agency ruled that the word was only to be used if accompanied by quotation marks. After the 2005 bombings in London, the British Broadcasting Corporation issued new guidance for staff to opt for less loaded terms than terrorist, like militants or extremist. That was one of the, the debates that took a long time to, to, to sort out in the, in the BBC. It was misreported in the press, as it usually is, uh, that we banned the word terrorism. We hadn't banned the word terrorism. What we did say was it is much better to use the word that more correctly describes the activity that we're talking about. Bombers, gunmen, fighters, insurgents, whatever the term is, and only use the word terrorist as a last resort, except where it was quite obviously that the act was an act of terror, an act deliberately calculated to terrorize the population. Journalists reporting political events have to be careful because the stories they report are already framed by the language used by those in positions of power, be it at press wow. conferences, in official statements, sources, or even institutional names. Countries, organizations, militaries name their defense forces. Just that name, defense forces. What if a defense force goes on the offense? Is it still a defense force? If Israel calls its army the Defence Force, then for the sake of clarity and for the sake of simplicity, if nothing else, uh, I think it's probably right to call them by that name. At the exact moment Israeli Defence Forces began hitting their targets in Gaza... We tend to call uh, separatist movements the by the name they choose for themselves. Right. We tend to call insurgent groups by the names they choose for themselves. I think people are quite used to this, and they're wise enough and sensible enough to know that if this insurgent group is calling itself this, we don't have to go along with all the adjectives it uses to describe itself. They call themselves the Free Syrian Army. They name military operations, Operation Desert Storm, Operation Iraqi Freedom, or whatever it's going to be. The start of the campaign called Shock and Awe. So these are loaded terms. They are often going to reinforce the meaning that its authors, meaning governments, give them and therefore, almost by definition, they become propaganda. Uh, everybody does it. So what do you do as a, as a news organization? Some of these things you can get around. You can refer to the Israeli military. You can refer to the war in Iraq. Al Jazeera's style book has addressed all these words. Terrorism, Israeli Defense Force, Islamist, War on Terror, 
you won't see any of these on the auto queue. But in the world of 24-hour news, increasingly driven by digital content, our style guides are still as influential as they once were. Social media and citizen journalism are undermining traditional news institutions using new technology and introducing random, chaotic elements to the news discourse that no style guide, however well considered, can possibly contain. Journalism is now in the middle of some very dramatic changes in which anybody can declare themselves to be a journalist, can start a blog, can start a social media site, and that's terrific, you know, it's, it, it widens the debate. There can be these editorial guidelines that give clear rules about the use of problematic terms like terrorism. But it's when you get into a breaking news situation and you have cable news filling up its 24-hour news cycle with kind of talking heads and chatter, waiting for the next news update where speculation and rumors really drive things, that you have an imprecise use of language. This was a dark-skinned male. These pundits and experts and presenters and journalists are just sort of talking to fill time. And they don't have their, you know, an instant checker with, with, the, with the guidelines. That's why the AP style book remains important uh, as a source for, for neutral language. Uh, there's much less standardization anymore, and so words can mean anything to anybody. More Global Village voices now on terminology, style guides, and the power of words. I don't think that all media outlets should have a standardized style guide. I think that borders on censorship. I think that it's a style guide's job to push us to ask if the words we're using are precise, or if they're offensive, or if they're actually saying what we think they mean. But it is a style guide's job to get the media to use those words in a thoughtful way, because that's what shapes public discourse. People who hate political correctness should love when an organization like the AP instructs its journalists to not call people illegal immigrants. It's not like using a term like that is some roguish defiance of authority. It's lazy and crappy journalism. Good style guides don't try to enforce some political view. What they do is they get language out of the way of reporters who are telling stories. Readers don't trip up on words, they follow the story. And that is something that's really important. Finally, YouTube, which seems like it's been with us forever, has just celebrated its eighth birthday. It was launched in May of 2005. The Google-owned channel now receives more than 100 hours of video uploads every minute. It attracts more than one billion unique users every month. To celebrate its birthday, YouTube asked the Gregory brothers, who made their online reputations by auto-tuning the news, to put together a video. Just to set it up, the one with the beard has just come home after spending eight years offline in the wilderness. And the first thing his brother shows him is this magical website. But be careful, he says, because once you start getting into YouTube, it can be very hard to get out. The Gregory Brothers and the history of YouTube is our web video of the week. We'll see you next time at The Listening Post. Could this be what I think it is? Yes, it is. Molly, Molly. But before you click, think real hard before you do that. If you don't slow down, you could get whiplash. What'd you say? I was watching cute cats. And have you seen the one with the little girl's rat? Wait, hold up. Don't go too fast. Once you dive in, you can never turn back. Life will never be the same. Now that I've seen chocolate rain. And I never knew a goat could scream like that. Or the simple pleasures of You might start small with a laughing baby Then you end up singing with common baby Life won't be the same again Now that I can drink more all my friends And I never even knew the band is Or how my eyebrows should be tweezed Oh, you too I could stay up late Watching drive through pranks For ten hours just so they